On the last episode of my gaming soapbox, we zeroed in on what I love and hate about modern combat design. Today, I want to share common threads beyond battle. Those I see in the best and worst games that drive me insane. From minor qualities that elicit a groan, to entire design philosophies that are stagnating the AAA space, I'll pull no punches in calling out the most detestable trends in the industry. Without further ado, here are my choices for the worst design trends in gaming. Number 10, Cookie Cutter Cinema. Let me say at the outset that I enjoy cinematic games. Climactic cutscenes, expertly crafted cinematography, and strong sound design carry many modern narratives. At their strongest, they rival their inspirations in film. While this is a worthwhile exploration of what the medium is capable of emulating, it barely scratches the surface of its full potential. A unique strength that lies in interactivity, opening the door to unparalleled immersion. An example is 2017's What Remains of Edith Finch. The player takes the role of an observer who reads a journal as they explore an abandoned house. This diary explores the history of misfortune the Finch family endured, passing away one by one as if by a curse. The player understands these final moments are cemented in history, and yet the gameplay that demands active participation in retelling these dark ends carries a heavy emotional burden written word alone cannot. You are unable to influence the outcome, yet you are the immovable hand carrying these stories to their somber conclusion. This style is shared in Lucas Pope's nautical detective puzzler, Return of the Obra Dinn. A vessel insured by the East India Company mysteriously disappears in 1803. Suddenly, it washes ashore with all 60 passengers missing. You are tasked with determining the fate of each individual. You're given a compass that allows you to hear a person's final seconds before death. You bastards may take exactly what I give you! <laughs> Then explore a frozen moment in time to ascertain any details you can to identify them and their cause of death. Your role in the story is that of an impartial observer, but as you pull back further layers of each event through interacting with each snapshot and reveal how deeply intertwined everything is, you become organically invested through interaction with the Obra Dinn. Lucas Pope's other masterpiece, Papers, Please, is an excellent example of shirking the role of an inflexible witness, and instead taking advantage of gaming's other unique storytelling quality, agency allowing you to actively shape the narrative. Working as an immigration inspector, you are the line of defense for Astatska against terrorists, wanted criminals, smugglers, and people with forged or stolen documents amidst law-abiding citizens seeking legitimate passage. As you pass or fail these hopefuls based on their documentation, other motivations creep into this black and white system. You can be given bonuses for detaining asylum seekers who have improper documents, or accept bribes from otherwise shady individuals that make up for the penalty of allowing them through. These decisions have consequences as you may let an individual with ill intent through to explosive effect. Or if you play two by the book, you won't make enough money leading your family to sickness and famine. All the while you have hopes of escaping the country yourself, something that requires money. Balancing you and your family's well-being, being a dutiful agent of your country, sympathy to others seeking a new life, and enabling influential change to this broken system by working with radical activists is a conundrum in which you cannot satisfy everyone. In contrast, a vast majority of games fall into a cycle of 20 minutes of gameplay, 5 minutes of cutscenes, rinse and repeat. You get a story dump in between detached gameplay sequences that rarely add to characterization. This is encouraged by how writing often works within the industry. Take Lucas Pope's former employer, Naughty Dog. An interview with CNN on the Uncharted series reveals that Uncharted 2's famous train battle and Uncharted 3's cargo flight and cruise ship sequences were decided upon before anything had even been written. This is common practice for game writers. They often start with broad narrative ideas centered on the chosen genre, setting, and projected gameplay loop. They must be flexible as the game is developed to see where the story can slot in rather than the other way around. This is how you end up with chunks of gameplay that have cutscene bookends. We are expected to suspend our disbelief that charming spelunker Nathan Drake can still crack jokes with Elena and Sully in cinematics between slaughtering hordes of mercenaries. We have no choice but to mow them down on our path to treasure. Yet it is not once addressed how bonkers the culling these adventurers participate in is. I guess Spec Ops The Line at least gave Nolan North room to explore the cost of war. What I'm getting at is there's a disconnect between the gameplay loop experienced in Uncharted versus the story it wants to tell. 
Cutscenes shouldn't be taken in a vacuum as stories separate from the player's input, and they certainly shouldn't be the default way to tell a story in such an immersive medium. I understand that certain cinematography is only possible when you take control out of player hands, but it should only be done when absolutely necessary, not as the de facto way to shape your narrative. Forcing cinematics hardly hampers games and narrative structure alone. It empowers an arms race for realism. I am blown away by the capability of modern engines. That such lifelike models can be made in fluid motion is astounding to witness, especially when I grew up in an age where characters looked like this. And yet there's an undeniable charm and appreciation I have for this era. Yes, I may have my nostalgia blinders on, but it's impressive the tricks developers use to give the illusion of grandeur bound by technological limitations. Take Final Fantasy VII Remake, a game I adore, so much that I went back to play the original. I have more admiration for how they use static backgrounds to give Midgar a sense of scale in the original than being able to see every pore on Cloud's face. If we could have that fidelity at no cost, I'd be all for it, but it is exactly those demands that are inflating AAA budgets, extending development time, and frankly shifting it away from hours I'd rather be spent making more compelling gameplay systems and means of storytelling. The over-reliance on hyper-realism also shifts away from more eclectic art styles that offer unique flair rather than a mirror of reality. Art is an opportunity to shed our skin for something more outlandish and exciting. I wish that was explored more at the blockbuster level. Whether or not you agree with this approach, photorealistic eye candy throwing optimization to the side is something we surely all detest. I could have included this as another bullet point for why emphasis on realism comes at a cost. Instead, 2023 alone proves it demands its own category. Hogwarts Legacy launched as a stuttering slideshow, particularly on PC where dips were so awful with appalling pop-in that there were reports of NPCs apparating before your eyes. Their initial attempts to patch these issues made the problems even worse. Star Wars Jedi Survivor has received seven performance updates since launch to fix its horrible performance and still cannot maintain any semblance of balance in the frame rate force. Final Fantasy XVI is landlocked on the PS5 where it suffers from inconsistent frame rates and graphical quality, even in performance mode, a setting that also introduced noticeable flickering and glitches in my personal playthrough. Starfield chose to intentionally lock consoles to 30 frames Games, while PC gets a chance at 60 FPS, hardly impressive numbers by today's standards, yet it struggles to reach either consistently thanks to Bethesda's signature polish. And while Baldur's Gate 3 is the oh dear, oh dear gorgeous of the Gordon Ramsay meme to Todd Howard's f***ing donkey, it's not without its own troubles. A titan of quality and commendable performance throughout its first act, performance begins to slide beyond the portion that received years of love and early access, especially in the third act with its demanding locales pummeling frames to undesirable lows. Five of the year's critical and commercial darlings all have moderate to severe performance problems, and this is only the tip of the stuttering iceberg. Forspoken ran like booty and played like it too. Wulong's PC performance was so ill-regarded I bought it on PS5, where it was still subpar. Wild Hearts was rampant with frame rate plunges, unbearable stuttering, and frequent pop-ins. And while it may not go for true realism, Tears of the Kingdom suffers from regular frame rate inconsistency at the behest of the Switch's limitations. It's frankly unacceptable how poor performance has been across the board this year. A star-studded roster of games, perhaps the best year in terms of overall quality we've had in the decade thus far, but it's been marred by poor optimization making it difficult to enjoy these games at their fullest. While a push for realistic fidelity is one of the culprits of these shortcomings, they all share a common thread that further exacerbates the problem. Bigger is better if the amount of shoehorned open worlds in the modern era are any indication at least. Open worlds with engaging discoveries around every turn that build upon the game's progression and guide the player to explore organically are brilliant. This is Tears of the Kingdom's biggest success. It's a masterclass in interesting, creative mechanics that encourage the player to explore and is brimming with literal and figurative treasures to reward that loop. This is in contrast to something like Hogwarts Legacy that leans more to the tired tropes popularized by Ubisoft with lackluster writing in a game emphasizing story, uninspired side quests, checkbox collectathons with pitiful value, tiresome minigames, shallow interactivity, and half-baked combat all packed into a barren world. 
About the only thing the game does well is act as a virtual theme park to wander and see all the scripted animations within Hogwarts. But without any interesting gameplay to allow meaningful interaction, it's hollow beyond the initial tour. The game would have been far better served limiting its ambitious map and fleshing out Hogwarts itself, treating you as an active student rather than an overgrown Gary Stu who has greater calling beyond the smaller school tasks Potter fans actually wanted to engage with. Instead, you're subjected to a chimeric hodgepodge of systems from other games and a listless effort to carry uninspired mechanics, none of which are fleshed out enough to be worth your time. That's another casualty of this design trend. Respect for the player's time. The amount of padding in modern games is maddening. In a play session of Starfield, how much time do you spend in menus and pitch black loading via fast travel in a space exploration odyssey? In Final Fantasy XVI, how much dead time is expended traveling through the vast world filled only sparsely with repetitive enemy designs and lackluster rewards for a half-baked crafting system? Or in the hub space, bouncing like a ping pong ball between endless fetch quests? What about the long animation for opening the map to travel back into the world? Imagine how many minutes of your life drained away over the course of a playthrough waiting for this needless animation. At least it's only a few seconds. Traversing Hogwarts Legacy's entire UI is an assault on your eyes, let alone your time. For Destiny 2 players who've racked up hundreds of hours, how much of that time was spent traversing via Sparrow? Not just for the sparse overworld activities, the campaigns themselves forced long, repetitive, lifeless traversal just to reach the starting point for a mission with a cutscene and loading screen to somewhere entirely different. How about the time spent in loading screens to the tower to grab a few bounties so you can load onto another world so you can traverse via the Sparrow to kill a few of the same enemies you've killed for a decade so you can load back to the tower to turn in the bounties. It's ridiculous. The modern God of Wars included various character building tropes that added nothing to the game. The gear stats were particularly egregious. The vast majority are simple stat boosts that change nothing about the way the game plays. Yet you have to sink time into sifting through them to survive. Final Fantasy XVI's aforementioned booty tier crafting is a similar stat boosting culprit, only offering minor cosmetic changes to your weapon, none at all to your armor, with no changes to the moveset in battle whatsoever. Accessories are similarly shallow, only one of which offers actual gameplay changes with reflexive slow-mo dodges that make everything else feel awful in comparison. You spend so much time in these menus for stat boosts that only serve to make you equally competent against the same enemies with power creep. This is an absurd effort to include a wide net of gameplay systems to satisfy everyone's tastes with no realistic way to flesh them out. This is a clear effort to broaden the appeal of games for sales, no matter the cost and streamline quality. Publisher pressure to recoup investor capital as budgets balloon to astronomical heights for hyper-realistic fidelity. Massive open worlds, diverse gameplay systems, complex UI animations, and the absolute size of teams required to deliver that in anything close to a reasonable time frame must be insane. But if the integrity of a worthwhile game is compromised in that pursuit, don't expect sympathy from a consumer base you're asking not 60, now $70 into, and that's assuming you aren't subjected to horrendous regional price gouging. Yet, it's been proven time and time again that Ubisoft's signature hyper-realistic, expansive, system-dense amalgamation sell like hotcakes. So why reinvent the wheel? This all glazes over how challenging it is to make divergent systems jive together in a cohesive manner. I mentioned that the teams required to deliver on these demands are quite large, stretching upwards of the high triple or even quadruple digits. While it's the responsibility of Top Brass to filter all these systems into a streamlined end product, how can you realistically manage that across so many individuals and teams? Making changes mid-development comes at the cost of increased budget, development time, and can have impacts on other tasks down the pipeline that required this now delayed project to be completed. This means when something is subpar, you do a cost-benefit analysis of whether it's even worth adjusting. And sometimes this means choosing to stay the course even if more time would have led to a higher quality game. I am far more impressed by games with modest ambition that fully realize their aims than games with unattainable scope that have to reduce depth to fit that wide lens. But it's becoming all too common to receive the latter. I understand at some point your game needs to ship. I certainly don't envy anyone who has to make those decisions, but once again, I reflect on this after the finish line. I only see the end product, and since you are asking for my money, my sympathy for mismanagement of project scope is in short supply. 
especially because it appears the goalposts of truly going gold are shifting further and further back each year. In all my griping, I've ignored a simple answer to the problem of fitting overbloated ideas into an unrealistic time frame. You don't. You ship the game in a debatably serviceable state and continue to iterate on your work with cash flow from end users. And that's in the best case scenario, many publishers just cut their losses to go with that fat check. The optimization issues I described are a key example of this phenomenon. Is it acceptable for a game to run horribly from day one? I say no, but money talks. If a large enough number of consumers are willing to overlook these faults, who's to say solid frame rates are necessary for a successful launch? Consider that a lot of game enthusiasts are not nearly plugged into the gaming zeitgeist as you or I. They play big releases that strike their interest on a whim, and at no fault of their own, may not have as discerning of an eye for blunders in frame rate or design. If anything, I would argue ignorance is bliss, and I would wager it's the reason graphics are still emphasized over frame rates. High fidelity images sell to that demographic more easily than fluid motion and something far less visually stunning. As for the more dedicated audience, they weigh the cost-benefit analysis of how far they can push your goodwill before you reach your limit. Cyberpunk 2077 is a perfect example of this phenomenon. Released in what I would consider an unacceptable state, the game still boasted 13 million units sold in its first two weeks. This was assisted by some shady marketing practices that obscured the full story, one that unraveled as its core audience was less than enthused with what they bought into. Yet, after three years, it saw a 2.0 update and DLC that launched to rave reviews. Finally, the game is what it should have been at launch. You only needed to build pre-alpha and beta builds for full price to consumers to get there. Ultimately, I commend CD Projekt Red for not abandoning the game. The same cannot be said for countless floundering failures over the years such as Anthem or Marvel's Avengers. Why do games like this get shelved despite developer interest in writing the ship? Well, for one, they sold quite well in spite of their critical failure. They've already made plenty of money. No point in letting them limp along at a high cost. In the end, critical success doesn't matter for continuing titles like these, it's that they failed to maintain an audience. Engagement as a defining metric in the industry is plaguing where capital is invested. It's no longer enough to make a single purchase of their title. They realize that if it's possible to keep you on the hook for a game like Cyberpunk with a one-time fee, it's equally possible to keep you glued to a game that encourages regular purchases. They want to know how much you play, how often you play, and how to increase that total to the perfect number that maximizes what you spend. How does a game accomplish this? From the mouth of one of the industry experts, Destiny 2's general manager Justin Truman in a 2022 game developer conference presentation. And more than anything else, being a service is about being fast. For a live service, more than anything, more important even than quality, a live service is about being fast. Like back in 2010, you could, you could have a long lasting high retention game just by releasing something that was super high quality, really well balanced and unchanged that players kept coming back to for years. But, but to stay afloat as a service today, you need to be constantly feeding your players. You need to be responding to their concerns. You need to be making the game better. I can't believe this was publicized. In short, it is more important to put a consistent stream of content in front of players regardless of quality. But then he contradicts himself because he says the goal of feeding your players is listening to their concerns and making the game better. What he's saying is you pump out content to keep players engaged and meet those timelines in spite of quality standards, then take advantage of the player base's goodwill to drip feed further subpar updates that are under the guise of addressing your concerns. You matter to us. It's not your wallet. Definitely not. You know what the difference is between 2010's landscape to now? Monetization outside of what Justin calls the box product model was non-existent. Microtransactions were still in their infancy. DLC was the primary method of added value service. You needed to actually sell me on playable content. Unless you were Todd Howard at the forefront of this enterprise with Oblivion's horse armor. In 2023, we've been inundated with so many forms of monetization, advertising, and demands on our shortening attention span that yes, you need to compete with fast service because otherwise you'll lose the manipulative hold over a player base that is drawn in by a trough of barely passable content that you release regularly enough to keep the players revisiting the Eververse. 
Not that you aren't charging for the ongoing season model, on top of premiums for expansions, and now dungeons too, because why let content you actually spent time on go without an extra dip into customers' wallets? This is my final disdain for the modern gaming landscape. Over the last decade, we have slipped into a never-ending stream of demands for our attention in an effort to monetize everything we do. Gaming is no exception to this. Yet, unlike many modern necessities that are nickel and diming us amidst record inflation with stagnating wages, gaming is a luxury. It's an escapist hobby that allows us reprieve from all the noise shouting at us to buy now, to pay up, to work yourself to the bone. Except now, they're asking us to. Modern examples of monetization in gaming are outlandish compared to 2010. Star Citizen has had half a billion invested by backers since the height of the Kickstarter trend in 2012, who've received nothing outside of a limited alpha with some fancy ships to fly around in after 11 years. Fortnite recently settled a case with the FTC for a $245 million settlement for refunds to consumers who were subject to dark patterns. These are deceptive design tricks that have been shown in psychological studies to dramatically increase the likelihood of a subject taking a desired action. An example are websites that shame you for selecting the action you'd prefer, increasing the likelihood you'll defer. Or those installers that have pop-ups with the common accept terms prompt that has the tiny fine print confirming you're actually installing a separate service of theirs. Or like in Fortnite, where they excluded common purchase confirmations, then trapped people into instant purchases by swapping controls. Circle is extremely common as a button for decline or cancel, with the cross button working as interact or confirm. And they are in Fortnite as well. That is until you swapped pages and they flipped their function. Tied with a total lack of purchase confirmations, this meant you would make unintended purchases without realizing it. How did they get your payment? By automatically saving your payment information after your first purchase without your knowledge. This allowed children to make purchases without parental consent. If you wanted a refund, the option was hidden, limited to three per user account, only available for certain items, and forced you through several tedious steps designed to discourage you from following through. If after all this nonsense you decided to dispute the charge with your credit card company, Epic has a zero tolerance policy to deactivate your account. This is dystopian levels of predatory practice. Thankfully, they're being fined and required to change these processes, but count on them and like-minded companies to continue adjusting just how far they can push consumer laws until they reach the sweet spot of jamming their hands in your wallet with the least amount of consent required. Until that approach changes, this is far and away my least favorite trend in modern gaming. I hope you enjoyed my take on the worst gaming trends. Writing this one was exhausting. As cathartic as it is to vent, it is equally depressing how prevalent some things like engagement and shady monetization are. It's something I struggle with as a creator because while it'd be nice to get regular sponsor opportunities from the sickest games with perfect reputations, the vast majority are mobile games in the hero collection gotcha style. Sometimes I think, okay, I'll take some of their marketing budget and do an ad read. My viewers are strongly discerning Giga Chads who will understand it keeps the channel afloat and to tap their phone a few times, wink wink. But man, and then I read stuff like the Fortnite filing and it makes me not want to live on this planet anymore. I want to return to a time where the industry is much more earnest in its artistic intent, but I guess it's always been a business. Monetizing art is such a strange juggling act. I appreciate you coming along for that wild ride with me. Thank you for watching today, much love to you, and I'll see you all in the next one.